My name is Bruce Mallory. I'm the director of New Hampshire <laughs> Listens and of the Carson Institute and the professor of education here at the university. Um, I'd like to welcome you tonight to this conversation about a fascinating, complex, and a bit unpredictable um, a set of events and phenomena that are taking place. Um, since mid-September, mid our nation has experienced an unexpected, apparently spontaneous, largely peaceful form of public expression of dissent, beginning at Zuccotti Park in New York City and rapidly spreading to other major cities and college campuses, as well as to cities in the United Kingdom, Sweden, France, Finland, the Netherlands, Japan, and Hong Kong. Two weeks ago, I was in Iceland and came across a modest array of tents and Occupy signs at the main square in downtown Reykjavik, the same square where protesters gathered last spring to object to the payment of the country's debt to European banks in the wake of their own mortgage lending crisis. Robert Kuttner notes two particular characteristics of the Occupy movement that distinguish it from other forms of protest and dissent. First, its spontaneity is remarkable. He compares it to the spontaneous events associated with the early Tea Party gatherings. Kuttner writes, quote, there's something about the ideologically inchoate character of popular economic frustration in our era that is associated with both movements on the left and on the right. The second distinguishing characteristic is that this movement can't be reduced to a few words like end the war, stop global warming, repeal Obamacare. There, is, there are no explicit demands in the movement. Rather, there's a broad statement of dissatisfaction with the increasing economic inequities in the industrialized world. The organizing slogan, we are the 99%, is a statement, not a demand. We're left to decide among ourselves how to respond to that statement. <clears throat> <laughs> this movement is also taking place in the context of democratic movements in traditionally undemocratic <coughs> societies, notably in parts of the Arab world, and as we speak tonight in the country formerly known as Burma, for example. Democracy is not only about equal representation at the voting booth, it's also about equal access to social and economic opportunity. The courage of democracy seekers that we've witnessed in other parts of the world over the past several months may be part of what is catalyzing the Occupy movement in the US. Lastly, the movement is testing the First Amendment of our Constitution. Hundreds of occupiers, a large majority using nonviolent tactics of civil disobedience, have been arrested in the last 24 hours in Los Angeles and Philadelphia. Hundreds more were previously arrested in New York, Seattle, Houston, Portland, Chicago, St. Louis, and elsewhere. The images of peaceful student demonstrators at University of California, Davis, being pepper sprayed by campus police is one of the more stark examples we have seen of the tension between free speech and the maintenance of public order. All these factors have led up to this evening's community dialogue. The university decided to be proactive by creating this opportunity to come together so we can both express our personal views and listen carefully to the views of others. We have three primary purposes for this dialogue. First, to engage the UNH community in a civil, open dialogue about the Occupy movement in order to consider diverse perspectives on social, political, economic, and legal issues that have created and sustained the movement. Second, to examine the role of dissent dialogue and nonviolent protest in the Occupy movement. And third, to consider the particular role of a university, its faculty, staff, and students in the Occupy movement and similar forms of dissent. After we hear brief remarks from President Huddleston, UNH junior Alex Freed, philosophy, philosophy professor Nick Smith, and Chief Paul Dean, you'll engage in facilitated, focused dialogue at your tables around the questions that are listed on the program in front of you. And if you so choose, you can also uh, uh, consider the questions that Professor Smith distributed a few minutes ago. Also listed on your program in front of you is a set of group agreements or ground rules 
that we believe are important for assuring a productive, civil, <coughs> passionate conversation in which diverse points of view can be expressed and common ground might be created. We ask that you commit to these agreements as part of the dialogue process. We also ask that you respect the role of the facilitator in your groups. These good folks have volunteered to help you have productive conversations, to assure that everyone who wants to get the chance to can speak, and to not interject their own views into the dialogue. At the end of your small group discussions, we hope you'll be able to create one or two summary statements that represent your collective ideas at each of your tables. These can be in the form of this we believe statements or these are our recommendations for UNH statements. You'll decide how best to do that within your groups. We'll ask that each group share those statements briefly and concisely when we reconvene at about 8.45. Uh, I'd like to note that UNH Media Services is filming the beginning and end of tonight's events to share with our colleagues at UNH Manchester and to post on the UNH website. We won't be filming or recording the small group dialogues themselves. We also will be collecting the statements from each of these uh, small group conversations and we'll publish those on the website as well to let the world know what took place at UNH tonight. And before I ask President Hulston to come up last but not least important, the facilities, as they say, are down the hallway, down the stairs, and in that corner of the building. Uh, that's an important one. In any case, again, welcome. Thank you so much for coming tonight to be a part of this important moment for UNH and really for our nation. President Hulston.